I've been told I look like Mr. Clean this morning. I appreciate the insults. If I get any bigger, I can be an avalanche. My wife and I got in a fight this morning. Yes, yes, every Sunday. She was sitting in a chair, and she put a quarter in each ear. And I said, what are you doing? She said, I'm trying to listen to 50 Cent. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. We went out dancing the other night, and there was this guy just going nuts on a, the dance floor. He's break dancing and flipping backwards and just out of control. And she said, you see that guy over there? I said, yeah. She said, he proposed to me 20 years ago. And I said, looks like he's still celebrating. <laughs> <laughs> That's what she gets when I asked her if, she, she, if I could go ice skating out on the lake, and she said, wait till it gets warmer. <laughs> All right, 2 Corinthians. Uh, we'll be in chapter 1 and 2. Paul is writing to a very dysfunctional church. Um, I'm certain it was much like this one. Uh, but they were divisive. They were very sophisticated and educated, but uh, carnal, materialistic, false wisdom. And uh, he's being undermined by men who think they're super spiritual. They're called super apostles. And uh, one of the things that has happened is, is that Paul wanted to go there and he wanted to visit them, but you're going to see as he reveals his inner life, uh, this, many of the things a minister will feel and go through. And I think it's a real treasury here. And what they accused him of is he promised to come and he didn't come. But he goes on to say, look, I didn't come because there's so much tension between you and I because of this undermining from these false, false apostles. That's why I didn't come. And then he's going to go on to say, uh, however, you know, man may break his promises, but God never does. He takes their, their focus off the failures of man, real or perceived, and puts them on the promises of God. So with that in mind, let's go through some of this text here. A little bit of review this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse um, 8. For we do not want you to be ignorant, brother, of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure, above strength so that we despaired even of life. Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead, who delivers us from so great a death and does deliver us in whom we trust that he will still deliver us. And what he's saying here is essentially that God has delivered us. He is delivering us now and he will continue to, del to deliver us. And remember, Paul was constantly delivered from, from threatening circumstances, whether it was riots or stoning. He started a riot in Ephesus because he spoke about idols. And of course, the, 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 the uh, businessmen there had a huge idol-making uh, 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 fortune there. And of course, it started a riot. And uh, how many times in the past did you ever say to yourself, if this ever happens to me, I think I'll die? And you're here and you're alive, and yes, it happened, but you have many deliveries. God will continue to deliver you. You're being delivered right now. And be thankful for the multitude of mercies that you've received that you'll probably never, ever be aware of. You know, and uh, so he, uh, just trust in him is the whole idea. And so as we look at this, you know, let's continue on a little bit. Verse uh, 11, you also uh, helping together in prayer for us that thanks may be given by many uh, uh, persons on our behalf for the gift granted uh, to us in mercy for our boasting is this, the testimony of our conscience that we conducted ourselves in the world in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but the grace of God and more abundantly toward you. And he goes on to say, uh, let's see what he says here. He says, I wanted to come to you, but I couldn't make it. That's the next few lines. Verse 17, he says, therefore, I, when I was planning this, did I do it lightly or the things I planned? Do I plan according to the flesh? 
that with me there should be yes, yes, and no, no, am I a man of my word? But as God is faithful, our word to you was yes and not no. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who preached among you by us, by me, Silvanus, and Timothy was not yes and no, but in him yes. For all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him amen to the glory of God through us. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ has anointed us in God, who has sealed us and given us the spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. Moreover, I call God as witness against my soul that to spare you I came no more to Corinth. I mentioned that before. Not that we have dominion over your faith, but our fellow workers for your joy. By faith you will stand. Suffering first. Johnny Erickson Tata, she crippled herself in a diving accident here in the Chesapeake Bay. She goes around the world speaking, encouraging people. And she shares that a week before she was paralyzed, she asked God, it, 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 she asked God uh, to draw closer to her. And then a week later this happens, and her attitude was, is this how you treat Christians? And she wanted to die. And finally, she realized, well, God, if I can't die, then show me how to live. And for the next several years, she lived with a stick between her teeth because she couldn't move any body parts. And she flipped the pages with this stick, you see. And we have with us in our suffering, she realized, the most God-forsaken man who ever lived in Jesus Christ. That God wrote the book on suffering, and he entitled it Jesus and here Paul is encouraging them, that, and so was Joni in her visits around the world, that God never intended for us to suffer alone or without purpose. And that's why spiritual community is essential to a thriving soul. God will afflict your souls as well as your bodies. But he's always after a deeper healing. She recalls when she went to a healing crusade that she was among all the hard cases there, and then they shone the spotlight to the one side and then the other side, and, and people were getting their sinuses healed and legs lengthened and all the hard cases remained the same. They ushered those people out early. She's 15 deep. And, and wheelchairs to wait for the elevator because they didn't want the, 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 the main crowd to see all the unaffected deep cases. And she said, something's wrong here. Something's very wrong here. And she realized that God wanted a deeper healing, a soul healing, a resurrection of the spiritual life over and above su surface physical healing. Jesus is always after a deeper healing. That's why he waited in John 11 for Lazarus to die. He said, I know you want a healing, but I want a resurrection. I want you to see that I'm way beyond superficial things and temporary things to creating new life from the dead. And he's always after a deeper healing. And learn, number one, if you learn anything, learn to appreciate the sanctifying effect of suffering. Learn to see suffering as sacred. And we will learn as we go on into eternity to sing about the suffering of God on our behalf, how he enters into our suffering, you see. And God tells us that our weakness is the secret to strength because that's precisely where God takes over. They press us into the suffering Christ. They're the sheepdogs of God driving us to Calvary. And what Johnny Erickson Tata said, she said, after a while, she said, I don't want a new body. I want a new heart. And we, as we study the greatest sufferer in history, Jesus Christ, and if in that we find answers in his suffering, then you and I can find answers to the suffering in our lives. God the Father lost a son too. He gave him to be with us in our suffering. And though we don't understand it, it's God's will. Was it God's will for Jesus, his only son, to suffer and die? Yes. And how did God conquer death? He embraced it. 
And so here Paul is dealing with a lot of issues here. And then he talks about this in verse 20. He says, for all the promises of God uh, in him are yes and in him, amen, to the glory of God through us. And you see what he's saying here is, yeah, I couldn't make it to Corinth for good reasons, but God never breaks his promises. Look at him, don't look at me. And what he says, first of all, is that the promises of God, I want you to see this if you see anything this morning, the promises of God come from his will. It's what he desires to do with you. It comes from his heart. It comes from the overflow. So when the promise comes, it's a shadow. It's a spilling over of the deepest desires of God for you. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I will never, 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 no, not ever forsake you or leave you. I will never make you an orphan. You see? And the promises of God, he's saying, are fixed. They're certain because they're God's promises. They have eternal purposes, you see. And even though man, the best of men, can't sometimes fulfill them, God always does, you see. And and so there is this eternal purpose in God's secret mind, the unrevealed, yet unrevealed mind, and those are his promises, and those promises reveal his deep purposes to you. It is the divine decree made manifest. Learn to reverence this. Think about God's promises like this. Think about God's purpose like, or purpose like this as God himself. God is invisible. It's the secret will and heart and purpose of the center of the universe. He's invisible, but his promise, his amen, his Jesus Christ, his yes, comes in the incarnation of God and Jesus Christ at Christmas time. And he is the revealing of the secret heart of God, the secret purposes of God. He is the amen of God. So when Jesus died on the cross and he said, it is finished, it was God saying, amen, this is true. I died for you. I will become the lamb myself. Genesis 22, same hill on which Jesus Christ would die. Abraham offers up his his son Isaac, you see. And so we see these things. God's veracity will not be impugned. Neither will his immutability, his unchangeableness. You see, if God breaks a promise to you, any promise, all the promises of God are yes and amen in Jesus Christ from the Garden of Eden to the end of humanity when Jesus Christ returns. Every single one, and when he returns, he says, behold, I am coming quickly right beforehand. But if God breaks a promise... It means that God has changed. And it means that the motives which drove him to the cross, infinite love and sacrificiality, now have no influence in him. He is something different from when he first made the promise. Therefore, he's no longer God. Therefore, his infinite love is no longer true. You see, he is the perfect God, and he would be less than God if he changed in any way. So God's promises streamed into our souls. It's the substance of hope, and it projects man into eternity and takes him to another world. And so when Jesus would come on the scene as the amen of God, when he really wanted to give the full force and authority of God's word to anyone, he would say, amen and amen. Truly, truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Behold, my plans for you are for good, not for calamity. The cross, Jesus, amen, so true. You know, in the, in the first century church in Rome, Jerome recounts that everybody, when they, when they heard the word spoken as a congregation, they'd all say amen at the same time, and it sounded like a thunderclap. Now, I don't like people saying amen and, and, and trying to work stuff up all through the the sermon because it it becomes distracting. And I don't like a worked up applause. I don't like crocodile tears. Let God be God. Let him affect your hearts the way he affects them. But learn to reverence these things. Jesus Christ, the amen of God, 
the full weight of the glory of God, you see. And so when he does these things, it's God just projecting himself into our lives. And then Paul at the end of chapter one says, listen, we're workers for your joy. We're not here to, to, to belittle you or control you or, or lord it. Or we want you happy. We want, we want you as happy as God is happy. That's our purpose. The purpose of a minister is the exact same purpose of God in your life, and that's to make your joyful. Jesus said, every word that I've spoken to you, I've spoken these things to you that your joy, may, my joy might remain in you. God joy, God joy. The gospel means joy news, leaping for joy news. And God is most glorified by your joy and satisfaction of him. Uh, you see, he created you to commute his lo- communicate his love and his joy. He, he, he created out of joy. It was a frolicking, playful, creative action of God. It, it, when you study the Bible, and the language of joy is, is praise and song and laughter. And sometimes it streams down your face. Nehemiah tells us that the joy of the Lord is your strength. That ever since the fall of mankind, man has searched for joy in the dust. And God, in his infinite wisdom, brings joy to our door. And he puts his happiness in us. Undeservedly, yes, you see. You see, God has created us to be a happy people. And so read your Bible every day. That's your happiness. Every word I speak to you is for your joy, that your joy may be full. You say, if you want to expand your mind, study God. He is the Lagos, the logic of the universe, the Lagos, the eternal word. Remember in 2 Samuel chapter 6, David was dancing before the Ark of the Covenant. You know why he was dancing? His body danced because his soul was dancing. And that's why when you come to worship, sometimes you just can't sit still. You've got to move. So next week, I'm bringing my leotards. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Many of you will have nightmares for years to come. (laughs) <laughs> There's my thunderclap. Yes, sir. <laughs> uh, but he throws his whole soul into, the, into joyful motion. And if you'll remember the account, he'd take six steps and he'd offer up a sacrifice. Six steps, worship, blood. Six steps, worship, blood. And it was God saying, your joy this congregation worship cost me the blood of my son. This is a sacred thing. And you are never to disrespect it. You see? And if you remember the story of 1 and 2 Samuel, it begins in chapter 1 with Hannah, a soul empty of life, a womb empty of life, longing for life from above, from heaven. And the king comes, the Ark of the Covenant. And it's a story of God's throne moving through his people, seeking to rest and reign in the midst of them. Don't miss these pictures. They're not just stories. You see, I want to tell you that every culture has a joy myth. And in our culture, at least for years, in the 50s and 60s, uh, our joy culture, the conservative joy culture was Ozzie and Harriet. Leave it to Beaver. Make room for Dad. Did Ozzie ever have a job? (laughs) Did he ever have a job? Did he work? Does anybody know? It would be scary if you did know. But, uh, yeah, and so, you know, here you are, this kind of of life you're going to live. You're going to live in suburban uh, America, you can have a white picket fence, two cats in a yard, life used to be so hard, and you know, the whole thing. And, uh, but then, and then you'll be happy. And then the more uh, progressive, modern concept is individualism. I can be what I want to be. Caitlyn Jenner, I can be whatever I want to be. 
Babe the Pig, remember? I want to be a sheepdog. You watch any cartoon now, and I'm not knocking this, but they're just expressing the whole rainbow. You know, uh, you've got orange and green and blue, and you've got a horn coming out of somebody, you know, all inclusivity. And I understand all that, but it's a product of a creeping progressive culture. And you know, see what happens is, is that the soul, if it looks for happiness somewhere else, it's like a dark hole. You gotta remember, you are an expression of the Chabad, the heavy, radiant glory of God. That's what you were made for. And you know what a black star is? It's a massive, heavy, weighty, radiant mass of glory that is now imploding on itself. And it sucks everything around it. And when you don't have God in the center of your mass, in your soul, your soul sucks in everything around it and it never makes you happy never makes you happy. And you see, that's what happens. And many of you have come from addictive pasts. Many of you probably, may, maybe a lot of you still are struggling. And I understand drives and I understand disabilities and all these things, chemical imbalances and all these kind of things. But essentially what addiction is, is worship. It's the one thing in life right now that you must have, you see? So any kind of addiction to a degree is a theological problem. You are an imploding star. You are sucking in everything around you. Think it's gonna make you happy and it never does, you see? And so Jesus created a universe in joy. It fell as man looked for joy in this world. And now he came the second time to bring a regenesis. He was the gardener, he died, he was planted in the ground, we are the harvest, you see? And you and I are, have become conductors of God. Now look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1, we're going to spill over into this a little bit. And he's going to respond, apparently what's happened is, is in 1 Corinthians there was a man who was having an incestuous affair, uh, it seemed, with his stepmother. Uh, now the Corinthians and their sophistication thought they were being loving and progressive by allowing this to go on. See how loving we are. And he said, this is wrong. You can't allow this to go on. Deal with this. They dealt with the person, but now that person is overly uh, burdened. And he's saying, hey, now restore them in love. That's, that's the essence of what you're going to see. But our lesson goes much deeper than that this morning. Look at this. Second Corinthians chapter 1. But I determined this within myself, that I would not come again to you in sorrow. For if I make you sorrowful, then who is he who makes me glad but the one who was made sorrowful by me? He had to make them sorrowful to make them repent and change. And I wrote this very thing to you, lest I, when I came I should have sorrow over those from whom I ought to have joy, having confidence in you all that my joy is the joy of you all. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote to you with many tears, not that you should be grieved, he says, but that you may know uh, the love which I also have abundantly for you. But if anyone has caused grief, he has not grieved me, but all of you to some extent not to be too severe. This punishment which was inflicted by the majority is sufficient for such a man, so that, on the contrary, you ought rather to forgive and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one be swallowed up with too much sorrow. Therefore, I urge you to reaffirm your love to him. For to this end, I also wrote that I might put you to the test whether you are obedient in all things. Now whom you forgive anything, I also forgive. For indeed, I have forgiven uh, anything, for if indeed I have forgiven anything, I have forgiven that one for your sakes in the presence of Christ, lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of our devices. And yet the sense that these people in the first century are very real, very fallible. They're not walking around with halos. They've got all kinds of problems. They're getting drunk at the communion feast. They're suing each other. Some of them are Steelers fans. It doesn't get any worse than that. I mean, that's just, that's just mental. But you see, he's talking about godly repentance. He talks about that 
in chapter 7 as well. And, you know, I always think of Peter being restored in John chapter 21, and they're fishing. Jesus shows up. He's cooking fish for him off to the side. He said, Peter, do you love me? You know, I, you, know I, you know, Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? <clears throat> he denied him three times. Three times he reaffirms his love. But he, he's getting repentance out of him, real change. And God will do that with all of us. He doesn't take crocodile tears. J.I. Packer wrote this, Seek the grace to be ashamed. You see, when you take shame out of the vocabulary of the culture, you are dehumanizing people. You see, we've come to a period in time where we're trying to get rid of the word shame, where shame is a sacred thing. It's when you realize you're not what you should be, and you want that corrected. And you see, two of the things that Jesus was doing there with Peter in John chapter 21, and Paul was doing with this fellow here in Corinthians, uh, number one, he's teaching Peter what he needs to know. And what Peter and you and I need to know is that we're not the people we like to think we are. He thinks he's Peter, the rock, and he's not. He calls him Simon. He says, you're shifting sand. You're pebbles, fruity pebbles. <laughs> and secondly, what does Peter need? He needs pain. He needs soul pain. He needs to be delivered from his own delusions about himself. So Peter needed to know this, I'm not what I think I am. And what so many people need first to understand before they go to church or before they quote unquote get the seed of the gospel in them is, is that I have a need. How many times do people say to you, or you say to them, well, are you a Christian? They'll say, well, yeah, I go to church, I do good stuff. Whenever I have conversations with people to ask me what I do, I say I'm a pastor. Um, all of a sudden their whole demeanor changes and they start telling me all the good stuff they do. You know, I feed, you know, I feed the poor or whatever, you know, and, and all this kind of stuff. And, and uh, you know, but, but this is what Jesus does. He comes up to a person and he says, do you really love me? I mean, that's the first command to human beings. Love the Lord your God with all your whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. You blow that command, you're damned. I made you love me. I didn't even make you to do good things. I made you to love me. And you don't have time for me? Why should I have time for you? You've kicked me out of your life. You treat me as a non-existent. Is there any dumber way to live your life? Will you hit 70 and say, what was that? Don't waste your life. For what? You want to get a gold watch when you retire, play golf in Florida? You know how hot and muggy it gets in Florida? I spend most of my energy down there swatting bugs. <laughs> Peter, you and I know you're not what you claim to be. You're hiding behind a mask, you see? And we feel shame, not, and it's sanctified shame not necessarily because of something we do or did, but listen to me, because of something we are. We are wrong and of ourselves. Our whole existence detached from God is a slap in God's face. It's you throwing God off the throne, putting yourself on the throne and saying, I know better. You see, we are something fallen. We are ruined cathedrals. We are made in the image of God, and the purpose of an image is to image, to display the original. Do you walk out into this world with that in your mind? I am here to display God to my fellow man and the way I act with them. I'm not talking about holier than now. Nobody falls for that. You've got to be stupid to fall for that. But I mean in the way you treat people, in the way you act. People. When you go out to eat, how do you treat the waitress? You know how hard it is to make a living as a single mother? 
as a waitress and you're too cheap to tip? Would you give them a track instead? They're not, they're not going to like Jesus because of that. How do you interact with people? An image bearer is to image, to display the original. And you see, Peter is called the rock as Jesus called him the rock because Jesus is the rock of ages and Peter was to image the rock of ages, to glorify the original. And we were made to fill the earth with reflectors of God. There are seven billion now, and each of those seven billion people are images of God. We're supposed to have seven billion statues of God on this planet. But mankind is a glorious ruin. I want to tell you this, that the universe is not about you. The universe is about God. I love that song, How Great Thou Art. I hear the rolling thunder. Don't tell me you don't think about God from time to time. When life gets scary, life gets hard, you see. Adam and Eve were naked and unashamed, but they were one with God. And as soon as they betrayed God in the Eden, the way that Peter betrayed Jesus, at the cross, they became ashamed. There was an unease within themselves in the core of their being. Now, what is Peter's most desperate need? What is this man in Corinthians' most desperate need? What is your most desperate need? And that is oftentimes to be hurt. To be hurt where we're delusional about ourselves, where we depend on ourselves for our wisdom and our strength. Don't you wince for Peter every time Jesus asks him, do you love me? Can't you feel the bravado just draining out of the veins in his body? It seems cruel, but it's restoring him. You see? You can almost feel it. You can almost feel him realizing, I betrayed my best friend who was God Almighty, who crossed the universe to befriend me. I betrayed him. And Peter now is in the only place where there is any real hope for him, and that is the mercy of Jesus. And let me tell you, friends, whether you're one year old in the Lord, 30 years old in the Lord, or not, you don't know him at all, the mercy of Jesus Christ, his mercy is your only hope. Because sin is relational. You just don't break some law. You betray God. And to deal with that, Jesus took your shame. He gave you his righteousness. And you know what Peter will do if you remember the story? After all of this grace, after all of this mercy, this is a picture of us. He says, well, what about John? <laughs> it was funny. Don't you do that? What about him? What about her? How come he's got a Cadillac? How come, you know, you're dang, dang, dang. <laughs> the king of the universe died in your place, took your punishment on himself, and you're starting to point at other people. Really, Peter? Really? Well, God's not fair. You, you know, how many of you wake up in the morning and go, you know, I'm stumbled. God is treating me way too good. Because that's the reality. Remember in Daniel chapter 3, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and then the, the Son of God appeared with them in the furnace, and Nebuchadnezzar looks in and says, you know, no other God saved this way. That's exactly right. No other God does save that way. And love is the meaning of this world, and love suffers. And if you want to know whether God loves you or not, look at the cross. Look at the cross. Repentance is holding still under the surgical knife of God or else he's going to cut stuff you don't want cut. And this godly sorrow leads to repentance. Worldly sorrow leads to death. Worldly sorrow is upset about the consequences, not the trail of God, you see. And, and it's all about you. I want you to think, and we're going to go in just a few minutes here, but in the Gospel of Luke, two thieves on the cross, Jesus in the center, and the one unbelieving thief, he's, you know, they're all saying, hey, he saved himself. 
or whether he saved others, why doesn't he come down off the cross and save himself? If you're really God, why don't you, blah, 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 goes on and on. Let me tell you something. People always want God to work any other way than how he's working. It is not an intellectual problem with the Bible. The problem is not thinking it through at all. How could God do this? And the second thief that wound up believing, he says, listen, we're getting what we deserve, godly sorrow. This man has done nothing wrong. You see? And the selfish thief, you know, his attitude is, well, you know, if he's got he's to do this, he's got to do that. You see God as somebody to serve you, your agenda, undo the consequences of your sin and your foolishness, you see. And creatures demand the Creator to bow to their wisdom. And you know what? The un- what when you look on the news and you see horrible stuff, and there's constantly horrible stuff going on out there in the world, you know, programs like The View. Uh, <laughs> but the unspe- it's a reflection of the unspeakable horror in our souls, which began in the souls of Adam and Eve when they desired a piece of fruit over God himself. And before that fruit dripped to the ground, it was necessary for the Son of God to come and spill his blood on the ground. And I tell you right now, don't be afraid of sickness. Don't be afraid of death. Be afraid of remaining shallow and unbroken and your soul untouched because suffering is a path into the heart of God. You see, God wants to showcase in you and I the kind of power that moved Jesus Christ to the cross and stayed there for selfish people. A couple of things about suffering, and we're going to go. Number one, suffering is universal. The entire universe is suffering, not just you. Romans chapter 8, all of creation was subjected to futility and hope. Number two, suffering is historical. It's linear. It happened in a point of time in history in the Garden of Eden, and it will end with the second coming of Jesus Christ. Third, your suffering can't compare to the eternal weight of glory it is producing in you. You will not think about it one second in heaven. And number four, what has happened in this world, the fall of mankind and creation, is judicial. Somebody caused this to happen, and we're told that the universe was subjected to futility in hope. That means God did it in order to display his glory through the cross. Satan didn't do it in hope, and certainly Adam and Eve didn't do it in hope, you see. And so, as we look at these things, you see, it's, the cross is the glory of God, man, God treating man way better than he deserves. And I'll tell you, you know, our, uh, suffering in our lives, it begins pretty early. It begins with, with diaper rash, you know, colic, um, you, 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 and so many questions pop up, I'm sure, in a baby's mind. But just think a one-year-old. You take a one-year-old to the doctor, and they're thinking something like this. My mommy is all-powerful, and she's all good, and she's sovereign over my life. Why is she taking me to this doctor to stick a needle in me? And that's us with God. <laughs> He's the infinite, eternal God. You see? You know, the baby asks, why am I being spanked? Why am I being spanked? I'll tell you why. Because Tara is a masochist. (laughs) (laughs) 
And you see, without the suffering of God's Son and without the patient suffering of his saints, the world will never see God in his glory. Of course the world wants a God that gives them a Mercedes Benz and a better job and a better this and, that and all that kind of stuff. And so how do the sufferings of Jesus Christ, which display the glory of God, arrive in people's lives? Through you. And you will be subjected to things that the average person doesn't handle so well. But the glory of Christ will, will shine through the cracks that he's developed in your life. You see? From 12 men 2,000 years ago, 12 apostles, to 3.5 billion now believing in Jesus today. Suffering. Persecution. That is our comfort, you see. That is our comfort. Oswald Sanders, I'll close with this story, tells the story of an indigenous missionary in India. He's walking from village to village in the blistering sun. They drove him out of town. He goes outside of town, lays under a tree. True story. He slept. He was awakened by the whole village. They were all around, and the chief said, we came out to see what kind of man you are. And when we saw your blistered feet, we felt bad for rejecting you and concluded that you must be a holy man with a very important message for us. Whole town got saved. And you see, God will leave gospel scars on you for the world to see that you have a message. You see? That you have a message worth hearing because you are the body of Christ. You and I are God's offerings to the world. And you have one life to live. Don't waste it. You have one life to live. And all of your eternity is hinged on that brief one light, life. Don't hit 70 or 80 or 65 and say, what was that all about? What was that all about? Let's have the worship team come up here. Father, we bow our souls to your goodness. We drink life from your heart. Our joy is in your words and in your spirit. I pray that anyone here that doesn't know you, Jesus Christ as Savior, please open yourselves. Ask Christ into your heart to be your, your master, your king. Give yourself to him wholeheartedly. You don't have to understand everything. Just let it begin. He will be your instructor. If you need prayer of any kind over here by the double doors, we have two folks you can pray with. During, we're going to sing two songs. During that first song, you can come down and pray with these folks. If you need a Bible, we'll give you a Bible. But, uh, you know, they're there for you. And the ushers now are going to come down. They're going to take up an offering. And we pray now that God gives us a generous spirits of giving. In Jesus' name, amen.